You're listening to the Thoroughly Good Classical Music Podcast, a conversation between listeners and musicians about the music they love. This podcast is available on Spotify, iTunes and Audioboom and via the Thoroughly Good blog at www.thoroughlygood.me. Please rate, like and share the podcast via Twitter and Facebook. To get in contact, email john.jacob at thoroughlygood.me, message at Thoroughly Good on Twitter or post a message on the Thoroughly Good Facebook page. Hello, podcast number 24 in the Thoroughly Good Classical Music podcast series features violinist Jennifer Pike, whose seventh album, one dedicated to Polish violin music and helpfully called the same name, is released on the Shandos label in the first week of January 2019. In this podcast, you'll hear excerpts from some of the tracks on that album, an exploration of some of the stories of the composer's lives, uh, and you'll also gain an insight into some of Jennifer's experiences back when she embarked on her professional music-making career after winning BBC Young Musician in 2002. This podcast was recorded in late December 2018 and published on the 2nd of January 2019. This morning, yes, and then of course. <laughs> but you make it sound as though you're having to d- defend yourself. No, I just. I... I'm used to having to do that as a musician. You know, have you done your practice? You know. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. My life, isn't it? So you do. You're playing every day. Uh, if I can, I mean, sometimes you travel from place to place, and you, you don't get the chance to you know even get your hands on the violin until you get to the hotel late at night. Um, and if it's a situation like that, then I try and hold on to the violin and just do it without the bow and just try and warm up my fingers. It's, wow. it's like being an athlete of the small muscles, really. Uh, so if you go a few days and you haven't played, would you ever go a few days not having played? Um, actually, I have done that um, and is that weird? this week because I've weird? come back from a tour and I've needed to do it. Not weird at all, no. no. <laughs> really <laughs> no. nice. <laughs> not weird, actually a relief. Yeah. Um, I find that I have to write every day. Um, and if I don't, I will start to feel as though I'm going a little bit mad. Oh, Even yeah. That's not to say that if I, whatever I write is interesting. It absolutely isn't. But... But there's a, there's almost like a habitual thing, and I suppose I'm wondering whether you have a doing yeah, it. yeah yeah. And so do you, do you yeah. just feel a little bit like I feel as though I'm cheating on somebody if I haven't written, and I'm wondering whether that's so for you. I completely get that. It's a sort of like an artist guilt. You have. Yes. Yeah. It, absolutely. Yeah. It's it starts to play with your play tricks with your mind if you haven't played for a while. I find I needed these last few days because I came back from a tour and actually I felt it being cathartic just to have a few days away from the instrument. But that doesn't mean to say that I I, I didn't play a bit of piano, you know, and kind of do a little bit of research in some way, musically, uh, coming up with programmes, but I've needed to have that. But the feeling of, oh my goodness, the violin is calling f- to me, you know, I, I do have that feeling, yes. I, I'm imme- I immediately want to find out about the tour, because if you were playing and it was really cathartic, <laughs> what, what happened on the tour? Well, it's, it's been about two months of really intense concerts where I've needed to focus every day on something I haven't had to, you know, no break, absolutely, you know, focusing on the next thing constantly. So it's been rare to have... A weekend, you know, free in, in that time. It's just so that was two months of so, playing every day and performing every day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, what a yeah. nightmare. So, Be a professional I love musician. it. I love it. <laughs> but, but I needed those, you know, few days completely off. Where was the tour? I need details. Well, Who did you fly with? Where did you stay? <laughs> well, it started. Um, well, it started off in Poland. I've had a wonderful time in Katowice, um, which was fantastic. Um, went to Switzerland. 
um, and played Mozart and the Zurich Chamber Orchestra loved doing that and then the Czech National Symphony Orchestra came and did a, a tour and I joined them with Bruch and Vaughan Williams Lark Ascending and other treats um, so I've just been travelling like. and so counterfeits were you at the Nosper Concert Hall no I didn't I went to the Academy um, but that's uh-huh, an amazing uh-huh. hall the, the, yeah. the new one my goodness but yeah the, the Academy was where my dad studied years ago with Henrik Goretzky, and so it was amazing to come back there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Had you been there before? I'd never been to Katowice before, so it was... I went there in... This touches on what we're meant to be talking about, but we, <laughs> which we will get to. Uh, but I went to Katowice um, a few months ago. Uh, I loved it. I loved the trip. Uh, it was only for three days, but it was, um, it was marvellous. And they were incredibly friendly mm. and extremely sarcastic. They which are. really, really <laughs> helped me. No end. Um, and uh, <clears throat> they took me on a tour. A musicologist took me on a tour of the academy shortly before term started, I think it was. I think it was in September. Mm. And she told me that there was only about 150 students mm. in the academy. And it was, it was massive. Yes. It was across split sites and really gorgeous and not like any conservatoire in the UK. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing how dark they are, the people in, in Poland, a lot. The yes. character is, is, you know, yes. it's interesting to me when you said sarcasm. Yes, they, they are. They are. They, okay. Somehow they knew that I didn't like heights, and they took me on a tour. The, the marketing director took me on a tour of the concert hall, and he said, oh, we're going to take something very special. And I went, oh, okay. And we were recording a podcast to be doing it. And, um, and it turned out that actually where he was taking me was right to the top of the oh, concert hall where you can climb. Yeah, very, very thoughtful. Tell me what this is about, well, please. Well, it's about the Polish violin, as the cover gives mm-hmm. away on the front. Um, so it's a real exploration of the works that I, I've loved for a long time and discovered. And hopefully people will, will keep playing it and these works will become... You know, more more a staple in the concert hall. Are they not? Are they are they not a staple yet? I would say so. Yes, most of the pieces on there. I mean, the Szymanowski myths are not played very much. Um, the Moszkowski guitare is a Moszkowski is a composer that that is sort of. I mean, he's appreciated, but not really played that much. And also, Karl Wojciech is really on the on the edge of the canon, people call it, the sort of, you know, known composers, yet he's so important and he's just such a discovery. I've Why is he it. important? Just okay, saying things I'll like say he's I'll so it. important I mean, isn't music, enough for me. His music is, is his legacy, um, his, the style of music and where it sits within Polish music and, you know, the whole spectrum of Western classical music. Um, because his story is fascinating to me as well because he died really young in his early 30s in an avalanche in the Polish Tatch Mountains. So these, this amazing place, um, these beautiful mountains in Poland, in South Poland, was his spiritual homeland. He loved um, the mountains. He composed with these mountains in his mind. And, and also he was a skier. He was a real pioneer of excursions and maps and you know into the Tatras and photography. So... He was, you know, this went is, on... Sorry, this is... Karl Wojcic, yeah. Okay, I can't pronounce that. That's all right. I mean, it looks like Karlovic or... Yes, well, Karlovic is better. But, but, yeah, yeah. Um, so.
pioneer in the tourism industry, yeah, I mean, essentially. Absolutely. <clears throat> he, he his pictures and you know he went on on all sorts of daring trips where you know he scaled huge heights and, and took pictures of these places and and as a skier he was amazingly talented. So how did you come to him? Well, actually, when I was very little, I'm half Polish. I should have probably said that at the start. Hadn't of your realized. Question. Hadn't realized. Didn't assume. <laughs> thought it was bad to assume. No, no. So um, you know, I grew up in that sort of area, going on holidays in that area. Although I, I was born in England, I, I've just spent a lot of time um, in that area where he composed. And walking past the place where his body was found, it's marked uh, with a stone. And when I was little, my grandparents would speak of this, this sort of legendary composer in a hushed voice, you know, oh, he, he died here. And uh, so years later, I've now come to his music and been blown away by it and also kind of feel this connection um, having kind of gone on those not quite same trips because my goodness <laughs> not, death to, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 not no. death divine trips no. uh, I'm going to have to drill a little deeper yes, because please, you I'll haven't you, um, you haven't really told me how you came to the music yeah. you told me about him okay. I'm a stickler for this <laughs> um, when did you when did you come to it then who introduced you how did you find it's it Carl Beach yeah. well my grandparents were the first people that, that, that told me about this composer. Um, and then, actually, I was in a music shop in um, Krakow, and I, I got this huge pile of music, so I was fascinated by, by you know, I thought, right, I've got I've to find loads of Polish music because I have to curate this festival. It was at the Wigmore Hall last year. Three concerts in one day of all Polish music. Um, and so it was just literally looking through this, this music. Is that how somebody goes about... Curating a festival and just go to a music shop. Okay. <laughs> but because it's so hard, I mean, actually, step one is how do you get hold of this music? And a lot of it is so hard to get hold of. Um, not, I wouldn't say um, on this disc specifically, Szymanowski myths and pieces like that are, are out there. Um, but the Karłowicz was in, um, <laughs> in this, this pile of music, and uh, I just started playing through, um, you know, with a friend, and I just thought, this is wonderful. Of course, he's the, the composer that my grandparents told me about. And then I came to listen to his symphonies, his tone poems, his other music. And, and actually, that was when I really fell in love with it. Um, so not just the violin music. There's a violin concerto, which is absolutely glorious. Um, in case You're saying that in a way it. that suggests that maybe you want to play that for somebody. Absolutely. <laughs> you were very perceptive. <laughs> right. Wow, that was written all over your face. Um, uh, what was it that you fell in love with? Because I yeah, heard that once, and I'm not going to tell you what I thought of, of any of this until you told Absolutely. me, the, given me the sales pitch, <laughs> and then I'll tell you what I think. No, this, is, this is really fun for me to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a genuine comment. Yeah. Okay. The, um, I mean, this the piece on the disc um, is in a kind of late romantic. It's it's quite Elgarian sounding, mm. so it's a, I would mm. say Salut d'amour. It's mm. kind of echoes of that. Um, but it's actually the middle section of the piece where I, I started to kind of be um, convinced by him, um, and it's the sort of the harmonies and the the, the actually this word in, in Polish żal, which is melancholy. Really, it's this kind of Slavic characteristic, which is a very deeply kind mm. of you know embedded in the soul of, of people uh, in Eastern Europe, and. Um, and this really speaks to me in this music, but not just this piece. I mean, I would say it's a beautiful, beautifully crafted piece with echoes of Tchaikovsky in there. Um, but it, it's more his uh, symphonic poems, his tone poems, which are suddenly really daring. Their uh, later works. I mean, later, you know, he was uh, so young when he composed them. But I'm speaking about 1908, when he was writing those symphonic poems. And, and it is the harmony, daring, the orchestration so imaginative. Critics kind of disliked his earlier works because they thought he was too influenced by Wagner and Strauss and Tchaikovsky because he loved these composers. Because yeah, that would be a bad thing, know, wasn't exactly. it? Yeah, I really love them, so I'm going to imitate them. Oh, you're no good at what you're doing. Yeah, okay. That's, that's typical critic. But they came to understand him, and his later works were really revered as being kind of daring and, and different and it sounds different to you know you might you might notice the influences in there but there is a unique voice in there i heard um i did do some research for this <laughs> obviously uh because i listened to all of your shandos back catalogue which you started 
You started recording with them in 2011. That reminds me of another question I do. I know we said that we would have a conversation, <laughs> but now I've just got loads of questions. Um, uh, and I think I heard you play the Franck on an album with, is it Chausson? Um, actually, that was a different disc, but yes, the Chausson concert. With Tom Poster. Great fun, yeah. Uh, a remarkable piece uh, for piano quartet. Yes, or string a double, quartet. double concerto, so piano, violin as a sort of concerto element, and then the quartet as well, which is kind of quite rare. Uh, and a really rich orchestration considering there are so many, or a rich sound considering yes. there's so few players. The reason for saying that is that when <clears throat> I loved it, really, really got into it, um, and I've not heard it before, when I then moved to this, to the Polish violin, this, the music on here, suddenly made Franck and Chausson seem rather twee and a bit Victorian and sort of a bit... Um, a bit smoking jackets and what have you, and almost like not quite there, whereas this feels... A lot of Polish music that I've come into contact with this year feels incredibly complex and... Um, yeah, really complex, yeah. actually. That's, that's the only word Absolutely. that I can use. It, it is. They're, they're very much pioneers, I would say. Um, I mean, especially the Szymanowski myths on there. Mm. I mean, that's just mind-blowing. I mean, the last myth especially is... I would say mad is a word I would describe. Mm. It's it's so intangible. You can't somehow make head or tail of it, which is the idea, I think, because it's about the sort of dryads and gods and chasing each other. And it's kind I of found, I, So I listened to that yesterday, um, and I realised that you it would be a bit weird to provide you with personal details of my domestic arrangements, but, <laughs> but I spent some of yesterday putting out Christmas decorations, uh, and it would be fair to say that I'm not very patient... And I get quite worked up about Christmas lights. Well, so it's I mean, quite annoying. People, yeah. uh, and I was playing the myths at the same time. And there was a point in time, and I can't, I can't tell you what movement it was, but there was a point in time when I was thinking, I'm feeling really wound up. Yeah. And the mu- I'm not saying that the music wasn't helping, but there, there was something about the music that was yeah. making me think, I need to just turn that down for now. very strong you can get from this music absolutely no doubt about it because it is designed to I mean it's it's mad the harmonies half quarter tones and you know double stops with trills and it's so intense it, it's it and then suddenly it changes into this incredibly beautiful music so it, contrasts are really important and you, yeah the effect you have um listening to the, these works is often quite well, having intense. a really bad, <laughs> I realized we're meant to be selling the album but it was it was as though I had a really bad headache. It's like a nightmare, I would say. <laughs> that last, that last, yeah. is a, it's a nightmarish okay. music. So, it's yeah, a, you yeah, do recognise what I'm saying. Absolutely, because okay. I mean, the myths on there are looking forward into a world that, I mean, it, it sounds modern now. 
listening to it. It's written hundreds, year, you know, hundred years ago, and it is still feels like pioneering music. Um, you know, so it belongs to real, real <laughs> forward-looking <laughs> composers. The other thing that I was uh, completely taken aback by was um, Roxana's song. Yeah, which. Um, I had heard a lot when I went to Catafitz. So I went, went to the Nostra Concert Hall, had access to the hall and rehearsals, and I heard that sung by somebody over and over and over again. It didn't really... I didn't, I didn't really know what it was at the time, and I completely forgot about it. And actually, when I started listening to this and stumbled on it, uh, I was completely blown away by it. Can you... I know how it moves me, but I wonder whether you can describe it. It's really hard. I hope you can, otherwise it's (laughs) going to be a really. It's haunting, isn't it? Yes. It's um, that particular work, when I first heard it from the first few notes, I was transported completely into a different world. It has that, I mean, effect. It's something about the writing which is just so direct. It really speaks, Mm. speaks to you in a way that. I mean, only the really top composers can. It's so simple, isn't it? It's so, and um, it shifts. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And the opera version, um, I, I was blown away by as well. I keep using that phrase, but there is so much, <laughs> so much Polish music that does have that effect. The opera, because um, it's from the opera King Roger, and this is an arrangement by Szymanowski's friend for the violin. Um, and the the opera version is is so. Um, Poignant, and it's like Ravel in the orchestration, mm. and it shifts into this kind of uh, impressionistic world. And uh, and the violin and piano version is quite intimate, but it's also got this. It's kind of like an Eastern um, influence. It's got these amazing harmonies that surprise you. that it's so much nicer to get a professional musician to describe the music than me trying to do it oh, myself. It's really hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 but you can play it. I can. <laughs> uh, and also the thing that I really like about it, um, and this is possibly me projecting, but there is 
um, there is a really top note, is there not? In that, uh, yeah. which is really, really high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is that a harmonic? Um, I think the one you're thinking of, yes. It I'm sorry is. to be so know, nerdy. I know, I just... no, no, in the middle of the piece, I think it is that you mean it suddenly goes very high. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's a harmonic. So, sorry. There are things like that that make me want to play the violin, and I have a violin, I just haven't stuck at the lessons. So there are, that's why I get quite nerdy about details no, like no, that. No, that's sorry, wonderful. It sorry, makes me happy sorry. thinking that you want to, want to learn after listening. Um, I think I prefer to just... Li- I think it's probably <laughs> best. The pragmatic approach is to just stick to this. Um, I, the, the other thought that came to mind when I listened to it was... Uh, particularly Shimonovsky was that it appears quite simple. Mm, yeah, you mean the myths or in general? Uh, generally speaking, because it's yeah. not... I don't hear very much that's fast, for example, in Shimonovsky's music. I don't know very much. Um, and I wonder whether I'm right about that, because it's, what I hear is, is really quite sustained and incredibly intense. Yes. And if that's the case, how do you go about preparing for that? Because these are not, to me, they're not pieces that you can just slip into a programme and, and switch from yeah. Brahms to... I mean, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. It's a challenge to put a programme together. There's no doubt about it with this music. Um, What I've tended to do is uh, I've looked back on composers like Wieniawski to to help that transition. So in a first half of a concert, it's been quite nice to, to... to have a have a warm in piece, something you know like the Vinyavsky Legend to, to mm-hmm, start, mm-hmm. Um, or to follow the Shimonovsky, which is kind of it belongs still to this world, yet it's um, it's more kind of I wouldn't say Elgarian, but it's more looking into that world um, of kind of of healing <laughs> before. Is it going a palate cleanser? This. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but I, I mean it's <clears> just it, it it breaks the ice, I think, with the audience, and then. Um, without you know making concessions because mus- musically they're wonderful pieces those Vinyavsky pieces are absolutely wonderful but then it enables the audience to kind of relax a little and then be allow- hopefully take them on this journey as you said when you're putting up the Christmas lights and you feel really kind of you know <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the right one I to start with <laughs> <laughs> but then I promise afterwards then you feel you know a kind of I don't know, not, not cleanse from the experience of listening to something like the Karl Robich afterwards, but kind of you've been on a journey. You know, you've been to the peak of the Tatra Mountains and experienced the weather that's been, you know, challenging, and you've had a tough time kind of with your, your rucksack and, oh, my God, the elements, and then you're by the fire and, you know, listening to Roxana's song. and um, You're very visual. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... With this music, it is. It feels that way. Um, I mean, Shimonovsky also, the Tatra Mountains in Poland were very important to him. He's got his, his house is still there. You can go and visit. So, yeah, it's like you have these panoramic views in your mind. And do you... Uh, this may seem a little deep for whatever day of the week it is in the afternoon. Oh God, is, it so is it a Thursday? Is it a Thursday? very um, <clears throat> uh, Do you approach that music with a particular image in mind or does the music evoke that image when you play they're sort of sensations in a way I would um, well it's a, that's a really good question um, thanks because <laughs> it's, it's difficult to analyse it yes is it difficult to answer um, it is difficult Great. to answer <laughs> um, I would say it's more that the piece um, evokes these images um, when, when, you're, when you're playing it, I, it it has the effect of that but with a piece that's so specifically linked to the Tatra Mountains, like the Karwabich Impromptu, it, having known about that before, perhaps, you know, it was easier for me to draw on that. Um, but, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I do get the, the sense of... It's more distance and space and um, rather than any specific image. Um, in a lot of Sibelius music, music, I get that as well. It's a, very much a kind of um, universal idea and, and senses and uh, I never feel I never feel freed by Sibelius. I always feel as though I've been served up something quite syrupy. I don't mean the music. Oh not not the music <laughs> syrupy, but as in as in it's incredibly intense and it's uncompromising. I love it, yeah. but it's in, intense and uncompromising and you probably only want to have a small glass of it because in that you can only have so much of something. I mean that's for sure. So I'm really impressed if you've for instance, listen to the whole of the disc in one in one go. That would Why wouldn't you good. do that? Oh, Why wouldn't people I'm do so that? I'm so glad that you, did, that you would do that. My assumption is, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that 
artists work with record producers with a view to putting on um, putting together a set of works which are meant to complement one another within one entire lesson. I mean, it's almost like a recycle. Sounds really corny, not but a recycle a, a recycle on a on a CD. Yeah. Is that not the point? That's absolutely how I would think of it. Um, but often people think of it differently, like a sort of you know a compendium, or you know one disc of an entire disc of one composer, and that's a sort of like a library type, mm. type of a, um, feel. But for me, I'm very happy that you, you would come to that conclusion when looking at the, the, the back of the disc because that's exactly how, how I kind of thought about it, was to spend ages agonising, really, which is what happened. <laughs> what works best? Following and I certainly, I certainly felt um, the benefit of the... I can't pronounce his name. Vinyavsky. 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 Yanyaski. Yeah, that's really good. Right, that's okay, a, thanks. It's not an easy language. Thanks, thank you, thank you. Uh, I certainly felt the benefit of that at the end, because it did feel as though I was sort of, it's all right now, we're just going to play you this and then you can go. One young musician in 2002, did you not, Jennifer Pike? I'm pointing at you in a rude way. You did do that, didn't you? Guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. That's how you, how you describe it. What was that experience like? Um, well, I do you mean, hate being asked about it? No, no. Okay, people okay. are fascinated by by what it was like, and it's so hard for me sometimes to to look back on it because I'm such a different person now. Great. You know, <laughs> with any luck. Um, and so to try to put myself back in that position is, is very, very difficult. But When you do that then, what yeah. do you see? I, I just see this kind of incredible elation and happiness, which is what, what it was. The competition was uh, very nerve-wracking and exciting and challenging, but it was a kind of very naive kind of happiness that, that, that was... The competition, yeah, yeah, and then of course it's a, it's like, like a swan is, on, you know, gliding on the water, and you don't see the the hard work underneath, the paddling furiously. But that that is a lot of what musicians' lives are about. So afterwards, that's that's what was happening. Um, your first Shandos album came out in 2011. I told you I'd done the research. I'm really impressed. That's, I didn't um, even know. <laughs> did you not? <laughs> You're aware that you recorded them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in knowing, uh, I can only ask this in a slightly rude way, but I'm interested in knowing what were you doing between 2002 and 2011? And that's not me assuming that you should have released an album in 2002. Yeah. I'm just wondering what was that, what changed in between that time? Um, well, I think I improved a huge amount from a violin playing perspective, you know, from simply... I don't know. Those years were kind of very important for, for me developing, I think, as a player. Um, and also from a life perspective. I think from 2011, I, I'd, I'd changed into the musician that I'm more similar to, I think, than, than when I was when I was 12. I think actually also I, I really wanted to record something, but, you know, I had been offered things that didn't feel right as well. I've had people say to me, oh, you know, I... 13 or 14, you should be wearing short skirts, have your hair in pigtails, you know, you, you should look like that. And I was quite geeky, you know, I was a, I was a real geek. They were saying that to you when you were oh, 13, yeah. 14? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm looking really back, shocked. I'm like, I'm really oh my God. But, you know, that that's 
that's what I was told. So, you know, I'm, I, I've been resolutely kind of myself and I've stuck to being myself. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy that I did. But I've had a lot of people pulling, trying to pull me in directions. So I'm But as a, as, a, as a performer at that age, they were suggesting that you should... Oh, yeah. Or I would be more um, accessible. Yeah, as an as an artist. Oh, I'm yeah. choking on my own range. I know, I know. It's it's so horrible for for me to look look back and kind of remember those comments, but they kind of come back to me a little bit more now, actually, <laughs> with all the times I've been mm. in, with the changing times and um, my perspective on what I have kind of gone through, which is absolutely nothing in comparison to to what people have, but. But it has been interesting thinking, oh my goodness, a lot of what people said um, have been good, but my goodness, I recognise a few really mm. kind of wrong uh, mm. things that were, were said to me. Um, but how did you develop in terms of playing? I, again, this is going back yeah. to the nerdy detail, yeah, but yeah. I want to know, I, I get that, <clears throat> I think we make a lot of assumptions about the competition mm. or any competition that once you've won it, then you've done it, when actually to my mind, it's one stage in a developmental yeah. process. So I'm sort of interested in knowing um, the three things. That th okay, well, we'll nail it down to three <laughs> okay. things. The three right. things that changed for you over that period of time, such that you were then ready to... Yes. Um, I'd say probably uh, discipline. I mean, I, I, I knew what I had to do in order to, to, to get something done. Um, as simple as that, um, because I mean the pieces I were, were, was learning, my oh my goodness, it was Rocha I think on that disc, um, and that was the most demanding music, most beautiful music. But you know I had a, a, a mountain to climb with learning Rocha's music, so I think that that number two would be, um, I think I'd just grown up a lot, and 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 that helped in the in the way I was performing the, the repertoire. I felt um, connected to myself, you know, as a young woman at that, at that point, um, which is kind of more, more helpful to me, I think. I don't know, perhaps if I was playing it at 12, it would, it would communicate something 12 different. seems just too long, uh, too, 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 too <laughs> young, rather. Too young. But the interesting thing, though, about <coughs> it is that I think you can have a sort of nostalgia even at that age is what what fascinates me I think is a kind of people often ask me we are you too young to play say the Mendelssohn violin concerto at that age and I think that you can have a I don't know not not a, a foresight into 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 life but I think you can I think the young people are capable of a lot of emotion and I think that it's easy to easy to kind of Disregard that and think. I, I can get. I know that, yeah. or I can see how a twelve-year-old or a fourteen-year-old could do the Mendelssohn. I, I yeah, understand yeah. that, but I suppose my assumption is is that that the majority of audiences. I'm making a load of sweeping generalizations <laughs> now, so fine. brace. Uh, that the, my worry is that the audio, uh, audiences will will marvel at a fourteen-year-old playing a work. And they will marvel at the fact that they're so young playing it when I want people to marvel at the fact that they are playing it in a particular way. And so yeah. their age is, of, uh, is irrelevant. Do you see if what I mean? If only there, there were, yeah, absolutely. More that, people that, like me, more is more that what you're like saying? You. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite simple. <laughs> I've had a lot of um, those different reactions. I think um, at that age, when you get this sort of admiration, you, you think it's because of what you've just played and mm. what you've given the music. But... Actually, it's it's quite a lot. Fifty percent is oh, you're so young. It's amazing how what you're yes. doing. And that did annoy me actually. It yeah, did. yeah, I think so because I did. I I assumed I assumed it was, you know, what I was giving the music. So then when I was growing up and I got a reaction from an audience that was, you know, it was perhaps less warm, you know, in my very naive way, I was like, oh, I wonder why they, you know, and I'm sort of. <laughs> So there you go. That was. That I was have a similar thing about the the MIO, because I when I hear lots of people, friends of mine actually, who listen to to the MIO play at the proms, for example, and they will wax lyrical about the MIO. Aren't they amazing? Yes, they are. They've also worked really hard, and actually, it's just the MIO, and they've got a long way to go, and they're yes. young, and I hate them for being young. <laughs> um, 
Uh, you didn't. You told me two things. You didn't tell oh, me three. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. else had changed? Um, <clears throat> oh, well, actually, <laughs> I don't think there is a third. Yes, there must be. <laughs> uh, because I'm. I'm also thinking that at that time, you know, there was there was a lot that I, I learnt. I'm trying to think from the experience. Oh, maybe it's just simply. I, you know, maybe being in a recording studio, I think I'm better, I was in a better place to, to, to do that. It was very intense um, to spend, you know, hours and hours and hours um, in a studio without many breaks. It was a challenge. Do you listen back to your own recordings? Obviously you do in the studio, but after, when they've been pressed and they've been released? <laughs> very good. Um, I think a, a famous musician, I can't remember who, said, oh, you spend your life l- trying to live up to your own recordings. <laughs> That's the problem with the recording industry. But are they dead? To, you know, de- is a bit of you, does a bit of you think, I, yeah. I'm, I don't want to hear that I again. I think with a lot of recordings, I've listened to it after I've made them, and then I've spent quite a few years away from it. And then when I've listened back, I've then thought, oh, my goodness, I was so critical when I was listening, you know, after, quickly after the event of recording and now I'm enjoying it, what's going right. on. So I think you do need sometimes a bit of distance with your own hard work because, as is the case with so many creative people, as I'm sure you know, you, your inner critic is, is quite, uh, can be quite loud. <laughs> I find that um, I'm asking because I write quite a lot of blog posts and I write them in a way that uh, I know lots of people who will spend quite a long time crafting them. And for me, I need to feel the motivation to write it and then I will write it and then I'll publish it and then it is dead to me. I don't want to... I rarely, rarely subed it, and, which is why they're very long. Um, <clears throat> and so because they're dead to me, I never read over them again, and then for some reason I will stumble on one, um, and then I'll read it and think, oh, oh, it's actually quite good, oh, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> do you, do, do you, is that it's a similar exactly thing? <laughs> right, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Fine, so it's, it's, it's to do with the inner critic. That's distance. what that is. Yeah. I know, and I think I read in a... In, I don't know, Cosmopolitan, I think it was, or something. I'm on a way, I don't read it. It's not a publication I read. <laughs> yeah, on the train. Um, but people actually, in, when we're talking about self image as well, um, that, you know, I mean, women especially can be quite critical of their, their, their own image. And apparently, looking at a photograph of yourself, the, you know, immediately after it, after it was taken, you get quite a negative, you'll have quite a negative, can have a negative re- response. And it's actually, if you. If you look at it six months later, it's amazing how that, that time can then soften result the in edges. soften it's the image, and you, you think it's all right. So you need that that distance and perspective, and maybe a lot of things. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me that I haven't asked you ideally about this? About the disc? Um, mm, well, you haven't asked me if I'd like to continue doing more Polish music. Would you like to continue doing more Polish music? <laughs> well, yes, I would. So, yes, I would. <laughs> so are there more planned? Um, not as such, but in my mind, perhaps there is, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot more music, you know, you describe... I'm interested in the reaction you had listening to the Szymanowski myths. In a lot of the kind of, I would say, uh, you know, contemporary music now, there's a lot of music out there which has this emotion and more and the real extremes of emotion. And um, I'm fascinated by that world. I'm I, I find that it's, and I experienced this when I went to Katowice. Uh, it's Katowice, isn't it? Not Katowice. Yeah, Katowice, yeah. Um, that it is, uh, it's almost like a drug. Um, it's not. I hear Debussy as a painting, uh, and it is something that is observed. Uh, this might be a bit weird, um, but Szymanowski I hear as a three-dimensional world, and I'm part of it. Uh, and I don't. I cannot account for why that is really. I wish I knew the answer to that, but I know exactly what you're describing. It feels like you are just. S- so profoundly kind of I don't know um, connected with the music in a way that's sort of really a three dimensional is the right way of describing it it's uh, just happening all around me yeah. and I can't um, 
I can't ignore it. It's a full body experience going and listening yes. to this music. I would Is say that, that what you want to explore? Yes, I'm that's now exactly, providing you with a leading question. But... <laughs> that is it, I would say. Um, in, in, a, in a live context, um, there's a composer, Knapik, who's actually a professor at, in Katowice, who hap- I happened to meet after the recital, which was amazing. But I performed his work last year, and it's 40 minutes of, and the first movement was, you know, like that last movement of the, the Szymanowski myths, so intense. It was like, you know, it's real, it's almost torture for the audience and the performers, I would say. You're really telling it. I know, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really, really hard edge. But that, you know, 40, that was the first movement. And then it took you on this journey from this turmoil to complete catharsis and complete, cl- like, sort of healing and timelessness and... Um, and, and, and peace, and it, was, and it was just the most wonderful experience to And that was this. who? That was... Um, Knapik, he's spelled K-N-A-P-I-K. He's a, a student of Messian, so it's, uh, oh. it's a whole world of kind of, um, yeah, uh, intrigue. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, so clearly and there, there is another Polish disc. I, I think, think that's what we're doing. There's another one coming. There's another one coming. When might that be? <clears throat> um, Have well, you I, asked anybody about this, or are you just I like floating talked, it now? <laughs> but you've, you've inspired me to, to kind of um, start afresh with the, with the idea. Um, but I have spoken to, to channels a little bit, so and they are interested in Polish music, so it might be something... I should hope so, <laughs> given they've just brought out um, uh, an album. Um, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you really want to say? <laughs> Not at all. No, okay. no, I would say um, it's lovely to meet you, and I haven't is asked it, you. Uh, is it really? What should I have asked you? I don't know. I mean, I, it doesn't matter. But are your Not Christmas now. lights now beautifully, beautifully on the tree in perfect order? Well, I didn't do the tree. My partner did the tree. Um, uh, I was responsible for the... <laughs> I was only responsible for the mantel And you messed it up because you were listening to the disc. No, I messed it up anyway because I was impatient. I had previously... <laughs> I mean, this is no word of a lie. I had previously broken a set. Because you know when they get really knotted? Oh. See, you've been talking yeah. really articulately about <laughs> Polish music and I'm just talking about Christmas lights. But when they get knotted, um, I just... Rather than untying them, I just shake the lights. No, I don't do that because that would be silly. But I tend to shake the ball of lights. (laughs) 